Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Common Hour. Uh, my name is Rick Moog. I am the chair of the Common Hour Committee this year and professor of chemistry here at FNM. Uh, before we, we begin today's presentation, I want to remind you that next week's Common Hour will feature Jean Kincaid es uh, Esquire, uh, attorney at Drummond Woodson, speaking on disability as an aspect of diversity. Uh, and let's start by thanking this week's pizza servers, Club Soccer. <laughs> club Soccer is a dedicated club committed to offering students a chance to play the best sport in the world. And that perhaps is some people's opinion. Um, without a burdensome commitment, come out and support our ever-growing club. Uh, there will be, as always, a question and answer period uh, for the last part of the presentation today, so please plan to stay until the end of the question and answer period. We will, as always, end promptly by 12.30. Uh, the question and answer session is open to members of the FNM community. We like to give first priority to students, so if you have a question, uh, please come up to one of these two microphones in the front. Uh, form a line so that our speaker has a sense of how many questions there are to address. And before you ask your question, please state your name, year, and or college affiliation. Um, also, immediately following Common Hour, there will be a reception in Ware College House, where the conversation can continue. Um, we, uh, and the last thing I want to say is uh, something that I mentioned to our speaker, uh, when I met him a few minutes ago, which is that this week, and particularly today, uh, by coincidence, is a very special day in many ways. Um, it only happens once a year, um, and it's very appropriate that he's here on the day today, because pitchers and catchers report to spring training. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Joe Pritchett, FNM's Director of Faith and Meaning. So as was just said, my name is Joe Pritchett, I'm the Director for Faith and Meaning here at FNM. Um, this was also mentioned before, but I want to remind folks about the reception that's going to be following Common Hour at the Ware College House. Uh, specifically, I wanted folks to know that there will be a couple of students kind of stationed in the back with a sign um, in case you want to come to the reception but are uncertain of where uh, where is located. So <laughs> they will be there. I have the great pleasure of introducing this week's Common Hour speaker, John Sexton. Dr. Sexton served as the president of New York University from 2002 until 2016. Prior to his time as president, he served as the dean of NYU's law school. He's also the but Benjamin J. Butler Professor of Law. Dr. Sexton has an extremely accomplished resume, and this in, in this introduction, I'm only kind of skimming the surface his many accomplishments. So among other things, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a past chair of the American Council on Education, the New York Academy of Sciences, and the Commission on Independent Colleges and Universities of New York. He served as the chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the chair of the Federal Reserve Systems Council of Chairs. While Dean of the Law School at NYU, he was President of the Association of American Law Schools. Dr. Sexton has been given numerous awards and honors, including 21 honorary degrees from colleges and universities in the US and Europe. He received his BA in History from Fordham College, an MA in Comparative Religion, and a PhD in the History of American Religions from Fordham University, 
and a JD from Harvard Law. He's authored several influential books, chapters, articles, and Supreme Court briefs. Before he arrived at NYU, among other things, he served as law clerk to Chief Justice Warren Berger of the United States Supreme Court. Similar, or additionally, from 1966 to 1975, he was professor of religion at St. Francis College in Brooklyn, where he was department chair from 1970 to 1975. On our way over here, uh, he had mentioned that he's in his 60th year of teaching um, in higher ed. So with credentials like this, you may be asking why he was invited here to talk about baseball and God, for it seems like he's qualified to talk about a great many other things that might not necessarily be related to today's talk. However, Dr. Sexton is, a passionate, is passionate about the game of baseball, growing up as a Brooklyn Dodgers fan at a time when New York City was home to three great baseball teams. While at NYU, Dr. Sexton has taught a popular seminar called Baseball as a Road to God, which he's currently teaching this semester, and wrote a New York Times bestselling book based on the course and its content. So I'm happy that he's joining us today, and please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. John Sexton. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for getting us started promptly, and thank you for the wonderful introduction, John. This, this is uh, this is going to be an hour spent in the transcendental dimension of human existence. Uh, uh, I'm not here to sell books. Uh, you, you can't get a copy of the book anymore except on the black markets. Uh, it took us two years to find a date that, 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 that worked for this, and uh, Penguin Press was very frustrated that I'm not interested in selling books anyway. I'm interested in getting ideas out there. Uh, if, if, if the club providing the pizza were a different club, and if they hadn't made such a triumphalist claim <laughs> about, about their purpose. I probably wouldn't have mentioned uh, my latest book, which will be out next month, and you can pre-order on Amazon. Please write good reviews if you do. Uh, it, it's a complimentary book to this, so I'm gonna actually start with the, w the way that book starts, and then go to the way this book starts, and then tell a couple of stories and we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but uh, let me start the way that book starts. Uh, it, it starts, and, and for the students, I, I, I want to bring you back to a time that you may not be able to recognize. Now, in addition to not being able to recognize the picture at the time I'm going to create, I understand that many of you who do not come from the center of the universe, Brooklyn, New York, may be having some trouble understanding my very heavy Brooklyn accent. But I, I have to bring you back to Brooklyn, New York, in the great times of the 1950s. So I was born in 1942, and yes, the math works. Next year is my 60th year of teaching, but that's subject for another day. Why I was allowed to start teaching at the age of 17 is a preposterous story that couldn't happen today, but it, I was following my passion. That led, of course, to my 2.1 college grade point average. <laughs> my children brought my transcript to college with them and would read me my grades first before they read their grades. And it, it's publicly available if any of the students need it for there is life after failure, uh, but but it, 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 we're, we're, I, I'm, I'm a teenager. It's 1956, not 1955. We'll come back to 1955 in a moment. But it's 1956, and I'm in a classroom in a high school in Brooklyn, and I'm being taught by a man who later burst on the national scene as a 
as a progressive and leader of the peace movement, in some ways the, 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 the Martin Luther King of the peace movement, a man named Daniel Berrigan, who was a Jesuit priest. And, and Daniel Berrigan wrote on the board in that classroom the Latin words, extra ecclesia nulla salis, outside the church, there's no salvation. And I went up to Father Berrigan after class. I'm a Catholic. He, of course, was a Catholic priest. And I said, Father Berrigan, does that mean that my best friend Jerry Epstein can't go to heaven? Because he's Jewish. And Danny Berrigan, a progressive man, said, John, if you don't baptize him, he will not go to heaven. That was the triumphalism of my church in 1956. It's a triumphalism for those of us that study the religions of the world, the great religions of the world, that one can find in every church. One finds it even in soccer clubs. <laughs> okay, the, the world's greatest sport. These, these overborne claims that are projections of self. But th there we were. We were the one true religion. Flash forward 60 years. And I could be in the Vatican for an interfaith conversation with 25 different religions represented, or flash forward to last week, and I could be in Abu Dhabi as the Pope is making his first visit ever by any Pope to the Gulf, and be in a conference with 100 leaders from 80 different faith traditions. And we've come to learn 60 years later a great arc of progress around a word that we, in my religion, were taught by a great man named John the 23rd the word ecumenism, which was see yourselves as others see you, as the great Scottish poet says. See, see your truth as others see you. Don't claim triumphalism. Enjoy the wonder of diversity. If there's, a, if there's a food you haven't tasted, if there's a music you haven't heard, if there's a place you forget that you've never met, if there's a kind of person you've never met, or if there's a way about thinking about the wonder of the ultimate meaning of life and creation, embrace it, embrace it. Not tolerance, not, okay, you can be there, I accept. No, embrace it through its eyes, not giving up your spot. The book that's coming out next month, which is called Standing for Reason, the University in a Dogmatic Age. Then having told that arc story, tells the story of the arc of our politics. In 1956, my father was the head of the Democratic Party in Brooklyn and worked with everyone, as our leaders nationally did. But today, our politics are revealed, not reasoned. We have our dogmatic faith. They're not discussable. They're beyond dispute. And what's the role of the university in that? Enough about standing for reason and the setup, but it, you'll see it connects because the title of the book, and I remember arguing with the publisher, it is not baseball as the road to God, it is baseball as a road to God. It's ecumenical. And, and, and the, tech, the frame of the book, and I'm, you know, in the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to try to explain it to you first theoretically, but then give you some stories that will illustrate the the frame of the book is to introduce students. Jason, where are you? Stand up. All right, on the count of three, I know this. I, I just want you all to boo Jason. On the count of four. One, two, three, four. Boo. Two weeks in my course, and he dropped one. <laughs> two, but, but a great kid. Who came here to transfer to Franklin and Marshall from NYU? So then, let's give him applause for that. I love him. He's here to see what he missed in the rest of the course. So, 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 uh, what the course is designed to do, and it went through several evolutions. It, it started with a student coming up to me and saying to me. I understand you're an aficionado of baseball. You care about baseball. I find it an ugly, boring sport. And I looked at him and I said, you must be from among the culturally unwashed. <laughs> I, 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 I said,
said, if you, if you will give me 14 books, let me assign 14 books to you, do an independent study, write a paper on each one of them, you will find out that baseball is a rubbish stuff. So it started 15 years ago as an independent study. And then the next year, having spread the word of this course that we had done one-on-one -on -one together, outside the president's office at NYU, there were like three or 400 students wanting to sign up, each of them for an independent study. And I said, no, I can't, I have to run the, you know, this is a huge university. I, I said, we'll do a class. And that's how the class began. And it began very simply uh, on, on a maxim that the greatest teacher I ever had, a high school teacher, the same high school as Danny Berrigan taught me, which is, it, it, what you want to do, especially in a place like f and but, but also in a place like NYU or any classroom I've ever had to, get the students to think differently. Get them to think strange, was the way my great teacher said. Get them to think strange. So who thinks of applying the serious study of religion as done by the greats, like the, the, the Rudolf Otto and Garcia Eliade and William James and, and and Rabbi Heschel, applying that to baseball and saying, is this a reason? And this, from the beginning, was not the surface stuff like a stadium is like a cathedral. No, no, no. It was getting in to the essence of the experience, the, the moment that touched. So, so some people, and the reviewers have been very kind to the book. It's gotten all, I don't know of a negative review, but they all focus in on the same thing. There are two words that are critical to the book. And, and one of them comes from Marcia Eliade's great work, The Sacred and Profane, if you want to do some reading following it. So you just pick up Marcia Eliade's Sacred and Profane, and if you like that, read his The Myth of Eternal Return. So, so Eliade, who's a University of Chicago professor, there's now a chair there named for him, a, a giant in the study of religion, but, but not Religion at the surface, not the structure of religion, like the hierarchy in the Roman Catholic Church, or, 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 or the intellectualization of religion, like, like, like dogma or the Tridentine Code, and says the, the doctrine of it. I mean, believe me, I did all those finger exercises. But, but, but uh, uh, how troublesome they are you get into it. You know, the church choosing for heaven's sakes Bernard of Clairvaux who led the second crusade and the Christ of war, using Christ for war and, and excommunicated simultaneously Avalon and, and, and dismissing the Christ of love. And, and all the ill that has come from that political so they are not the hierarchy, not, not the, the dogma over which we burn people. And when I say we, the antecedent of that is any religion you want. Because you see the same thing today. Okay, so, so not all of that. Let's, let, but, but, but let's, before we get to the sophomoric dismissal of religion as evil, the first debate that occurred at NYU involving a faculty member was about uh, six or seven years ago, the student set up a forum where a faculty member and a student debated two students on a proposition. I was still present. They asked me to be one of the debaters, and, 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 and they said, let's pick a topic. And I said, I'll defend the topic resolved that net, 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 religion has been a force for good in society. You know, this is the age of jihadism and so on. And it was interesting because when the, the house divided at the end, 80% supported the proposition. Uh, so let's get past the sophomore dismissal of the attack on the human, the human, the human beings that run our religions, or, 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 or the anthropomorphic intervention is God. You know, Richard Dawkins writes his life of Anton. He writes it, but, but, but kind of sophomore high school version of God. Let's get to the essence of it. And can we use baseball to do that? And, and uh, the two words that come out are, first of all, Eliot's word, hierarchy. Hierarchy, the Greek bathos shining through, and, 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 and hierarchy, the sacred, the shape, sacred shining through. And, and, and 
Eliot in the book Sacred Things says, <coughs> the divine sacred. The sacred is that which is not profane. So what's the profane? The profane is that which is not sacred. So this is a classic circular definition. And, and that's the essence that he illustrates in his book here. He talks about this examination after examination. And this, so, so just to give you one example, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Australia. It's a remarkable country, uh, which has 15 million people besides the United States, and it's essentially along coasts. And then there's this huge nation that's the outback. Now, people don't know this. I'm going to give you something. You've got something good out of the lecture, students. You can tell, tell your parents you've got a good thing for your education. The healthiest camels in the world are in Australia. Who knew? You know, but when the British arrived in 1791 with their prisoner ships and brought all these sick Western ideas to a society that's the longest surviving civilization in the world, 100,000 years old. I saw cave paintings that go beyond carbon dating, Mr. Chemist, that are 10 times as old as Altamara. Okay? And what was the, what was, what, what, what would a, the, the, the uh, principles of that civilization, 16, not tribes, language groups, characterized by welcoming the stranger and sharing. No notion of property. The British come in 1791, they bring their notions of property, they put up fences, they start shooting people that start eating their cows because they're hungry, and, and the whole thing begins to, to move. But anyway, there I am in the outback, having flown five hours out over no roads and, and, and gotten to a place the British call Ayers Rock, but the native Australians call Uluru. Google that, students, Uluru, U-L-U-R-U. Look at this, and there it is, rising, larger, much larger than this auditorium. A mass orange rock. You've seen the pictures of it. And, and as we're walking towards it, my children and I, with our native Australian guide, he is seeing Axis Mundi. Axis Mundi. The, where, the, where the, the gods and humankind channel each other. We're seeing beauty. We're seeing a natural wonder. And of course, if if we had been inclined to, we didn't, but if we had a priest along, now my family's all Jewish, I didn't want to go to Catholic, but if I had a priest along, and, uh, and I said, you know, Father, would you please, this is so beautiful, I'd like to celebrate the Eucharist here. And he would take out wine and bread, and he would consecrate me, and to him and me, that would be wonderfully spiritual communion with bread and wine that had become the body and blood of the Savior. And we were both all of that. And our guide would think we were eating our lunch. <laughs> so this is, there, there are these evocative moments where a hierarchy, the sacred shines through, that this pebble becomes the sacred pebble. And that's the liturgy, that's the essence of that's touching the experience. The, and then the other word, which is easier to explain, is the word ineffable, 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 I-N-E-F-F-A-B-L-E, ineffable, which means it can't be put in words. It can't be put in words. But the, and then, of course, that's what's happening in that hierophantic moment, right? That's what's happening, is that, 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 that we're touching something through our subjective hierarchy. But it brings us through. The liturgy brings us through. Or, or, or the moment br br brings us through. So since we're at a university, uh, 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 to quote Rabbi Heschel, you know, there is the known and the not yet known but knowable that research and advance of knowledge will bring. But then there is that next dimension, which is the ineffable, which cannot be intellectualized. We have this impulse to intellectualize it. So we, 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 we create our dogma about it to try to explain. We try to create words like the word God, which just as Paul Tillich says, confuses us in the end because it gets all kinds of baggage 
instead of understanding it as, you know, res reshape it as depth of being, whatever that is, the numinous. And then we create structures of power around it because that's what people do. And, and, and there we have this kind of manifestation, but it's all sucking the essence out of the experience, the ineffable. Uh, so, and if you think about it, and this goes back to Aristotle, the, uh, some of the most important things in our lives. So, I, I was blessed to be denied admission to all the law schools to which I applied because of that two point one index. You know, actions have consequences. <laughs> so I was denied admission to NYU Law School, which became very useful to me later when I became dean. <laughs> because alumni would call up and say, how can you turn down my kid? I said, they turned down me. Why shouldn't they turn down your kid? <laughs> but strangely, because of the vanity of one of my recommenders, who was a Harvard Law professor, Harvard accepted me on reconsideration, but I couldn't go. I had only applied to Harvard. I had applied to all New York schools because I was working with high school kids. I wanted to keep working with them while I went to law school. I phased that program out. I couldn't leave my high school students. But my reference was a Harvard professor, and he said, we should apply to Harvard so I can say to the other schools, I recommended you to Harvard too. So I did. So now all the four New York schools have turned me down, and the dean of Harvard calls me up and says, uh, you've been accepted on reconsideration got this angry professor in my office who wrote a four-page, single-space letter and is a vain person. I can't understand why I've turned you down, even though he tells me you're not going to come here. <laughs> and I said, will you, thank you for accepting me, Dean Gary, would you accept me, would you consider me acceptance valid for three years from now? I'll come. Because I have to honor my commitment to my students. When they graduate, I can move on. And And I walked into my first class at Harvard Law School, and across the room was this remarkable being, the most amazing person I've ever encountered. And two months later, we were married. <laughs> and we were more in love every day in this world until she died suddenly of one of these aneurysms. No warning, 10 years younger than me. Now 12 years ago, but she's still in my life. It's just, as C.S. Lewis said, a different form of the dance. And uh, how did Lisa come to understand I loved her? It wasn't through a syllogism. It wasn't through an argument. It was a kind of hierophantic. And if you think about what love is, it's not capable. It's ineffable. All right, so that's the framework. Now you've got the, so now I'll tell you a story, and then we'll open for questions, OK? So I said we would come back to 1955. Here we are. Students, there are years that count. When you make your list of 10 years, yeah, I'm putting aside stuff like you know, the day you get married, the day you were born, the, you know, that's over here. But then in the history of the world, there are days that count for all of us, like 1947. Jason, why is 1947 one of the 10 most important years in the history of the world? Stand up, stand up, show that you've learned something down here. No, 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 no. Now, that, 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 that is not just a, the wrong answer. It's cataclysmically wrong in two ways. Because the year the Dodgers won the World Series is another one of the years that's among the ten most important. <laughs> yes. Okay, sit down. In 1947 is the year that Jackie Robinson, number 42, the most sacred number in the history of the world. I have a number 42 with a circle on my academic gown. Okay, Jackie Robinson broke into the matrix. The date to which Jason inadvertently alluded. <laughs> October the 4th, 1955. Now, great points. I'm talking to the students. Great points. We didn't have televisions. 
Not kids like me, not street kids in Brooklyn. You know. The World Series was played during the day. My best friend, Dougie, and I were the only two Dodger fans in our neighborhood. The Brooklyn Dodgers were affectionately called, watch this now, think of the 2.1 college grade point average. Think about taking risks in your life. Think about not being afraid of failure. The Brooklyn Dodgers were called the bums. The bums by us. But they weren't called the bums in a, a, a pejorative, derogatory way. They were called the bums. We, 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 these were our bums. They, but but they, they were among the greatest baseball teams ever assembled. But there were three great baseball teams just in New York. And, and, and like in a Greek tragedy from 1941 right through 1955, the, 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 the Dodgers came that close. Once they lost the World Series on a passed ball by a catcher. I mean, everything, you know, it was, and you could taste it. And, and in the history of the team, they went back into the early 20th century. They had never won the World Series. And, and Dougie and I were the only two Dodger fans in our parish. This is Catholicism. And, and everybody else, including I'm going to now name names here that cause me. I, 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 thankfully, I have loving parents and a loving family and a loving wife and children, so I have a good bit of self-esteem. But were I were I less secure, even mentioning these names would cause all kinds of psychological harm that would require some therapy. But, but I mean, Louis Bojano, Louis Bojano, for example, who had been left back by times and was bigger than us and uh, so forth and really uh, and Frankie Knapp and Bobby McWalton these guys were Yankee fans and, and, and they would net us in the playground as the World Series approached up against those chain fences and, and, and they would say to us okay admit it and I'm going to allude to you can from context know the first name I met, uh, uh, mentioned is a Yankee and the second is a, is a, is a Dodger but for those Dodger fans or, or real baseball fans, you'll recognize the name. So they would get us up against the chain and fence and say, okay, it, 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 admit it, admit it, admit it. Mantle's better than Schneider. Rizzuto's better than Reese. You, you know, uh, Whitey Ford is better than Don Newton. Uh, you know, even they would say ridiculous things, like somebody's better than Jackie Robinson. I'd say, who could ever be better than Jackie? And of course, we were like the Christian martyrs. We would, refuse, we would refuse to admit this. And, and th th they would do what you did in those days. Because people didn't carry knives or guns or dangerous things. But you could beat the crap out of someone. Just, you know, broken nose or two. And they would do that. Uh, they'd beat us up and so forth. We would take it like, you know, a sign of badge of honor. So now it comes with both Buddhists every year. In 1952, the Dodgers and Yankees in the World Series. 1953, the Dodgers and Yankees in the World Series. I won't mention 1954 because it's a special scar there. But, but uh, in, in any case, it's October the 4th, 1955. And it's the seventh game of the World Series. So this is the day. A and the Dodgers had a journeyman named Johnny Padres, who had a losing record for the year, pitching for them. A and the, the, the nuns who ran our elementary school didn't have television or, or radio. They, they lived the life of prayer. So when something like the World Series was on, they would allow us, because we were like 80 of us in the same classroom, to tutor a seat. And how these women taught us, I don't know. But in, in any case, they, 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 they would allow us to uh, listen to the World Series on the radio. I now realize, because it gave them a chance to break out of the cloister. But we had had in our class, probably led by Louie, <coughs> done something wrong. And Sister, Sister St. James would not allow us to listen to the World Series. Oh. So we come out. We come out of, of school at 2.30. Now, 
if we had a big screen here with this, where they could push, I would show you that in an otherwise perfect set of teeth, I had no orthodontia. We didn't have the money for the fancy orthodontia. This tooth carries a chip. Back to text. We come out of school at Bridge Park, and we had these big transistor radios. And we turn on the radio, and it's the seventh inning of the seventh game of the World Series. And the Dodgers are winning two to nothing. And this journey with Johnny Padres is still on the map somewhere. And he's got a great change up that day. This is a different speed pitch. Throws it off the bat. And Dougie and I go, my head is like, we run the seven blocks to my house. And we go down into the basement where my bedroom is. And we take down from the wall a metal crucifix, which is about this big. And, and we kneel down, the two of us. And we've got the radio on now, and, and, and it's the ninth inning. And, and the Dodgers are still winning 2 nothing, And the Yankees are up one out, two out. Ground ball to Pee Wee Reese. Picks it up. Now you got to remember, pass balls, of course, is World Series. So picks it up, throws to Gil Hodges. The Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers, have won the World Series not only for the first time, but for the only time they ever will. Right? Because they're no longer up. They're now it is out in that plastic city <laughs> that will someday fall into the Pacific Ocean. Because of a man, excuse me, <coughs> named O'Malley who moved them. You know, and, and, and by moving the Dodgers from Brooklyn, started the whole boom and chain reaction that comes down to the fact that you people don't trust institutions. Because, <laughs> damn it, if they could move the Dodgers from Brooklyn, the church wasn't safe, the government wasn't safe, put aside corporations, they certainly weren't. The whole decay of Western civilization began with this man, O'Malley, who ripped out the heart. And don't believe Robert Caro or anybody that tells you it was somebody else. It was O'Malley, the bastard. That's why there are some of us that believe if you're in a room with Hitler, Stalin, and O'Malley, and you got a gun with two bullets, you shoot O'Malley twice. <laughs> So the ground ball to Pee Wee Reese, he picks it up, he throws it to Gil Hodges. We're holding in dynamic tension this crucifix between the two of us, and that son of a gun Dougie goes, hooray, let's go to the crucifix, and the head of Christ knocks it off the tip of my tooth. Now that is a hierophanic moment. I'm done. chapter in the book is that one. That's what I just did with the introduction. <laughs> uh, the favorite chapter in the book is the book on doubt. And uh, I came home this week with a, I don't believe in magic as well, of course, you can tell that. But when somebody gives you a second class relic, a piece of Mother Teresa's garment, you take it. But Mother Teresa famously said, in the existence of God. There is no faith without doubt. So the chapters of the book are broken up like that. We start off with sacred places, sacred times, but then the next one is about uh, faith and then doubt. My favorite chapter actually is the one of doubt. And then conversion, which explains how I became gay. 
But anyway, <laughs> now, and then we go on to saints and sinners and, 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 and curses and blessings. And, and that explains why Dante's seven rings of hell don't have low enough debts for either O'Malley <laughs> or Red Sox. But anyway, <laughs> so please, any questions, come to the microphones. Otherwise, I'll just tell another story. Because I got to fill until 1228. Tell me who you are, where you're from, what you root for. We gotta get a mic on here. Wait, Mike, don't you touch anything. Crack sound person. After then, technology. Got it? It's good. Oh, okay. Oh, See, cool. Look like, at that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Now in certain societies at a certain time, that would be a miracle. Yeah, no. no. Okay, uh, yeah, my name is Jack Abdallah. Um, I'm a sophomore from the Boone metropolis of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, I wanted to ask you a question because uh, my grandmother is a uh, devout Catholic and a, a Mets fan. Um, and uh, j that's just a detail I wanted to throw at you because I think you'd appreciate it. But I'm just wondering, is there something particularly about baseball that uh, gravitates to um, faith or could uh, other sports um, manifest in that kind of way? The rest of my family are, are all soft. I'm a Liverpool fan. What, what, you're all what? Uh, soccer fan. So, uh, so, oh, soccer. I thought we yeah, said socks for a moment. I was going to jump down and scare you. All right. Yeah. So, so um, that, that's a great question, Jack. And if any of your teachers are in the room, they should raise your grade by one. Yeah. Okay. But, 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 but so, so let me let me take Jack's question. So, first of all, if you understood the introduction I gave about Ula Boom, for example, or the sacred stone, or, 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 or the Eucharist, or you, you, you can multiply, once you get into the frame of what's called the phenomenology of religion, when you don't look at it as a structure or the intellectualization, you, you realize that anything is capable, right? So I, that's why the book doesn't make a triumphalist claim for baseball, and, and you would catch me in a terrible contradiction if I said to you, Oh, no, no, there is no other sport but baseball to which we could do this, right? The, the, now, there is none for me. See, that's the statement. And that's why I remain a Catholic, even as Lisa was Jewish and we raised our children Jewish, I could go and I could appreciate their spirituality and their liturgy, and I can try to understand it as we do in the ecumenical dialogue, but I remain in my, I remain in my space. I mean, that's the incarnation of, 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 of the man who became God through his actions, and I can even recognize other inter incarnations. And so I, I'm, I'm very comfortable around Muslim theologians, for example. Okay. So, so uh, no special claim made. You can write a book, Soccer as a Road to God, if you want. Now, here I'll now begin to come back a bit to my statement. There are features of baseball I discovered in teaching this course which are particularly good and, 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 and susceptible to this kind of analysis. And, and probably the easiest way for a person like you to understand it, because I can see in, uh, in your aura, because we, uh, if I, if you have a, your theologians will use forums. I, I, I can see in your aura, Jack, some stains of disbelief. And, 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 I, and I associate with you, uh, amazing for a person that b believes in a sport where a, a score that gets to three is like, you know, a bumper crop. <laughs> that, that, that baseball is, as that student said to me, boring. But see, that misses the fact that most of the action in baseball occurs between pitches. That, that if, if you become an active aficionado of baseball, it, 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 the first inning is different from the ninth inning. The beginning of the season is different from the end of the season. The seventh game of the World Series is the quintessential, you know, a, a, an excruciatingly slow uh, pitching duel 
where every pinch counts, the difference between a 3-1 count and a 2-2 two -two count, you know, and, and, and all of the things, the intricacies, where the players position themselves. You teach yourself as you learn to watch baseball not to follow the ball, but to follow the player and to see the ballet that goes on. And, and, and if and you read some of the great novels, and my students read uh, synoptically each week, that's why you drop the course. They have to read at least one novel, they have to read at least one reading on the nature of religion, and they have to write a paper for every class connecting the two, and then organically build as they go on. So, so uh, in some of the great uh, baseball novels, like the Celebrant, for example, there's, they're, they're talking about how the nine players move as a ball is hit, and that you can observe. So what baseball can teach you that then moves very easily over to the contemplative, spiritual, mystical life is observing carefully and hello students, living slow, slowing it down, and observing. So the quintessential experience for our family having been raised you know, in this philosophy is every time a child turns 12, we go down into the Grand Canyon for nine days. And it's just you don't see anybody, there's no out external communication possible, and you live in the simplicity of the most magnificent creation on Earth. And you find how fundamentally important water is, because if you don't hydrate, and how hard it is sometimes to find, and so forth and so on. So it's slowing, it's not, and, and that then leads to a kind of deep spirituality, and when you see that, you can see that in all religions. So, so, so baseball, in its very slowness, and it, it's, it, and its complexity, it's, it's not a simple grunting martial sport like football, you, you know, which, or, or, or basketball, the way it's played today, so, 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 so individually. So it's, it's so simple. It's a circuit sport. I used to love watching baseball. It's, it's now become a circuit sport. But baseball has this intricacy, which makes it particularly successful. That having been said, if you want to try to make the case for, for basketball these days, God bless you. <laughs> All right, my name is Will. I'm a junior. Will? Will, yeah. Doing a joint major in religious studies and government. Uh, also a Catholic kid from Brooklyn, and unfortunately, that's spent. Um, I'm just curious because uh, you're a contemporary, uh, not to, so I said grand, contemporary of my grandfather, <laughs> and, and he he grew up a Giants fan, um, and, but he speaks a lot of this, to the same experiences you did about you know gathering around the radio, listening to games, talking about all that, and he described the same kind of ineffability of it and not having words for it. I was wondering in all of your work and in the literature you've reviewed if there's any particular vocabulary, whether it's like Dirk Heim's book of effervescence or something like that, that you find particularly useful in getting across this ineffability of baseball experiences or whatever yeah. so it's a great question, and, and since you're a religious studies major, I don't think, frankly, for me, now, I want to make it very clear, okay? Uh, I have a PhD in religion. St. Francis College in Brooklyn where I was chairman of the religion department before I went to law school, uh, brought me back, because I love this place and they tolerated me, to teach a course, not on baseball as the road to God, not a religion course, but on one of my specialties in law, which is the first 16 words of the First Amendment, the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Government shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting and they thought it would be good to teach like this. There were a few hundred people there in the auditorium twice a month, uh, all of whom had been my students between 1965 and 75. This was kind of an alumni relations thing because those people now are their potential donors, right? And I was, at the time, very popular. I was teaching in classes of 500 because I was being kind of iconoclastic. I was teaching things like the joy of sin, or, or, or the death of God, you know, or Buddhism, you know, I mean, this was in a small Catholic college in Brooklyn. 
So, so, so you can imagine how it was like getting a course in pornography. <laughs> But when I, when I met with those students, and this is you'll see why I did believe this previously, I said to them, I always felt self-conscious then, because, and I say this in the introduction to my the book that's coming out next month, I was a, an unusual doctoral student in that I was getting my doctorate because I was interested in the subject, but not passionate about it. I was getting paid to go to school, and that I, I wasn't getting paid for the kids I was working with in high school, so let me continue doing that. So I, I never considered and don't consider myself now a really steep expert in this issue. Okay, you may have met, read more stuff than I. I did it with my left hand. It took eight years to right? So when I did, when I, and I said to my students in this class, I said, you know, when I taught you back then, I knew more than you did. And the classes were good, and you learned something, and, Thank you for making them as popular as they were. Uh, but I was not an expert. On the religion clause of the First Amendment, I'm an expert. You know, if there was a case in the Supreme Court in the 1980s, I was a lawyer for the case, right? So, so now I'm going to teach it the right way, you know, as an expert. So as I give you advice, but I, I would start with him, say, Elliot. Have you read a lot of Elliot yet? Okay, so start with him. If you, if you get him, read I. Okay? Then if you want to spread yourself out, I think on ineffability, read Heschel. And, and, and then take all that, after you've done that, go back and read William James. Don't read James first. Okay? Does that help? Yeah, awesome. Thank yes. you. Uh, Is this a co-ed school? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Jake Stimmel. Uh, Say it again, Jake. I'm Jake Stimmel. Uh, from New York City. Uh, I'm a pretty big Yankees fan. Uh, I'm really into like the wholesomeness of baseball, I guess. Uh, so like, what's your take on the, the new betting laws in America and how that might take away from the wholesomeness and just pure love of the game? God bless you. Uh, uh, so first of all, my friend James Trout, who uh, uh, taught for three years my baseball class with me, when I wrote the book, Baseball's Worth God, I had to decide, A, whether to assign it, because it seems stupid not to, and B, if so, when to assign it. So where I settled was, I, I do it in, in, in the 13 to 15 classes. So the first 12 classes, the students are developing their own thinking, and then they get my cut into it. It's not really a textbook, it's a completely different cut into it in class 13. And then 14 and 15, uh, we read uh, Doris Kern Goodwin's Way Till Next Year, and Pete Hamill Snow in August, and Tom Oliphant's Praying for Joe Hodges. And they're friends of mine, and they come to class, and they, they, the students live for two classes with people who you know, think the way we do, the four of us at least, about New York at that time. Um, but Jim says that John chose, in choosing his baseball as the Rose of God, the toughest version of baseball to defend his proposition, and the easiest version of God. Because you can tell my God is kind of a you know kind of crap. Very stuff. So 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 uh, Major League Baseball is, is is in danger of soiling itself. And, and I, I, you know, for policy reasons, I think that uh, legalized gambling is is extremely problematic because it's a highly regressive tax. Uh, it, it, it plays to the basis, but you know, that's as my latest book is all about how we're we're in a race to the bottom. Uh, I do not think the league should be cooperating with it. But one of my students is in charge of building it for NFL football, and uh, the commission of baseball was a, a student, and uh, I, I, you know, it's we, however, have to stand up against the wind. You have to stand there, you know, like shaking your fist at the ocean saying, receive, receive, okay? Don't lose your soul. Okay, the final question, how appropriate. Yes, who are you? Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a senior in history and Spanish double major. And by, by far the smartest question of the day. Go on. Thank you. Um, I'm a well, White well, Sox fan. Well, just better than that. <laughs> okay. Um, my question is, in relation to baseball or just anything that you've talked about, could you talk about your understanding of the difference between religion 
and spirituality? Wow. That, that's a great question. And, and um, I'm not sure. First of all, religion incorporates all of the elements that I've talked about. So when we use the vocabulary, it's a great, do you know the word exegesis? Do you know that word? So exegesis, uh, when, I, when I teach my civil procedure course or my constitutional law course, uh, uh, I tell the students I'm going to teach them to be exegetical in the same way Talmudic scholars are or Quranic scholars or you know, the great scriptural scholars. It's, it's studying words, and I say exegesis is the key to being in love. Because if you can understand, and this is not Derrida and deconstructionism about words that they have no meaning, quite the opposite. But words have many levels of meaning, many meanings. And a virtuous person can say something to a virtuous person, and it can be heard completely differently. And the key to being in love is understanding that exegetical thesis. And, and then trying to make the default position that if my now is reacting this way to something I've said, where is the misunderstanding? How can we work it through? Sometimes there won't be a misunderstanding. Then you have to communicate in a different way. But 90% of the time, it, so the word religion ha has all of the various meanings, okay? Spirituality, in a way, is a pure way of getting at this ineffable transcendent experience. But spirituality itself carries a certain amount of baggage, right? We tend to think of it as like the Maharishi Mahish Yoga and so, 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 so forth. So I try to avoid that word, okay? But I'm very conscious of the fact that the word religion has all these meanings and I gotta kinda unpack it to people. And that's why it sometimes is helpful to use words like hierarchy or Otto's Mysterium Tremendum Impossible or the numinous, words people are not familiar with because they don't carry the baggage. Tillich says this about the word God. He says all these debates about God to have, have, have carried the baggage of, of, of the art that attempts to diminish God or reduce God to something that looks like anthropomorphic and looks like us, or, or the big daddy in the sky, or, 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 or you know, and, and the, the uh, so, so I, the, the words both kind of can and go into the same thing, but uh, I'm now going to go back and I'll end with this. Uh, I would give you the pronounced big movie with Bon Jovi's palm uh, if you could do it, but it'd be too unfair to ask because it's too difficult a question. I'm now going to repeat the words that are the first 16 words of the Constitution of the United States, uh, the Bill of Rights. Congress, it says, I'm going to write that and say government, because the 14th Amendment is the first. We're a government constitution, so it's the same thing. Yeah, so you know the 14th Amendment incorporates the religion clause. So government shall make no law respecting the establishment of <coughs> religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. <coughs> thereof brings down the word religion. So there actually are 17 words, and religion appears twice. And in 1978, the first major article I wrote, which you can find, if you just email me, I'll send it to you, it's the easiest way, but it's in the Harvard Law Review uh, in 1978. And it's defining the word religion for purposes of the Bill of Rights provision. And in that article, I take the position, quite provocatively, first that the word appears twice, which it does, not deliberately. But second, that it has two different meanings. One for one side of the or, and the other for the other side of the or, if you take the intent of the framers of the Constitution seriously. That from what we know about what they were trying to accomplish with the religion clauses, because there's an or, the word has two different things. So defining the word religion even back then in 1978 was something that I began to realize was more complex. And that's not even in the field of theology. And important things turn on that. Because, for example, on one side of the or, I'm in my last sentence. I, I, I think I want, I want a plus for getting the train home exactly on time. But, <laughs> but on one side of the or, 
We're worried about religion taking over government. And there we should have a very narrow definition because, you know, there's no danger that a praying Native American beef and peyote will take over the government. But on the other side of the world, we're concerned about human liberty and the right of that Native American to use peyote, even if, so it's two very different meanings, in my view, if we are, and, and that just starts the conversation, and that's a fully secular conversation of religion. Which brings us back to baseball and the road of God. Thank you all. <laughs>